So, uh, and this is the first time we've done this sort of thing, and uh, it got a good turnout, which is great. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Yvon Sorte from the Institute of Deep, and he's here visiting us uh, on a collaboration using high numerical aperture lenses to trap uh, atoms. And while he's here, uh, I asked him to kindly provide uh, some lectures on on uh, optics and aberrations. So, well, thank you very much, Trey, uh, for uh, inviting me here in uh, in Europe, in America. Um, Give uh, you uh, a few lectures and my understanding of aberration. I intend to uh, convey uh, some piece of simple information about aberrations, Aber uh, information that can be used by everybody in the lab. So um, the way it is is well, first of all. I'm working at the Institute of Tea in Parizzo. And um, the course, the, the lectures I'm going to teach were inspired by these books. And the first of them, I strongly advise you to, to, to look at, uh, is actually now a five volume uh, book. And among them, the number one and the number three are really clear. It's the Handbook of Optical Systems by Herbert Ross. It's a recent book, actually bought um, the third volume. And then also I um, so and the third volume is about uh, aberrations. And also the books by Mahayana are really clear also. Of course, the principles of optics. And I put this one also. It's, you, you cannot find it easily. Uh, but uh, this, these lectures were inspired also from this very good trait of optic and stream of that. OK. So the general outline of these three or four lectures is the following. Uh, in this lecture now, I'm going to explain, go through a geometrical approach of optical aberrations. And then in, the, in lecture two, we'll go through a diffraction approach because in real life, um, diffraction has to be taken into account. Now, mixing aberrations and diffraction is something really heavy in terms of calculations. So that's why we, to get intuition about what's going on, I'm first going to talk about geometrical approach. Then in uh, lecture three tomorrow, I'll go through aberrations in practice on simple systems. And then in lecture four, I'll go with you through the main things, um, the main lines of Oslo, so that you can practice by yourself, and in case you don't have the Oslo Premium version, which is quite kind of costly. Uh, you can access the free educational version of Oslo EDU on this website. It is quite it is quite easy to practice with this software. Um, it's quite intuitive. Uh, the only thing is Oslo EDU allows you to use only ten refractive or reflective surfaces, only ten. So you want to design a complex system, it's going to be hard. Okay, so today's lecture is about the geometrical approach of optical aberrations. Also, please feel free to ask questions um, spontaneously during the lecture. Don't wait until the end. Just to let people know that are crowding in, we're, after this lecture, there's a second lecture, and we're going to move to a bigger room. So there you know which room? Probably 1204. Four. In an hour and a half from now? Uh, yeah. yeah. Meaning, if you sweat it out now, uh, you'll be rewarded with a better room later on. <laughs> <laughs> we'll point out you're five minutes late. 
Stigmatism, because that's the starting point. And then I'll talk about where do aberrations come from, going from rigorous stigmatism to aberrations. And then the geometrical approach itself, I will introduce various notions of transverse aberrations, wave aberrations, talk about the Goy theorem, the Niebuhr or, uh, relationships, and then the classification of aberrations according to Seidel. And eventually, I will go into the detail of what is called the primary aberration. So, what is rigorous stigmatism? As an optical system is said to be rigorously stigmatic, if uh, basically the optical path between two points, A and A prime, is a constant, whatever the point I that um, is on the uh, optical surface. For instance, here, you, I draw a spherical refractive surface, and the question we uh, ask ourselves is, are there a couple of points, couples of points A and A prime, for which this surface is rigorously stigmatic? If that is the case for these couple of points, the optical path, A, A prime, which is equal by definition to n times the geometrical distance ai plus n prime times the geometrical distance i a prime, its algebraic distances. Well, if this optical path is a constant independent of i, the answer for a spherical refractive surface is the following. I'm not going through the details today, but there are three couples of points. Do you think we should move now? The room is free. <laughs> <laughs> I think you must move. Oh, okay. Oh, you found me now. Okay. So, second try. Um, so, thank you. Well, I forgot to thank all of you for coming. I'm really impressed. You're so new. I was explaining what rigorous, or reminding, rather, what rigorous stigmatism is. And I, as I, I was saying, um, the answer to our question for the spherical refractive surface is that there are three, couple, three couples of remarkable points. The most remarkable couple of points is known as the jung weierstrass points. And this drawing actually respects the proportions uh, a and A prime are actually uh, positioned with respect to C, the center of curvature, and S, the vertex, using these relationships. C A prime, C A is equal to the ratio N prime over N, the two index of refractions, times R, the radius of curvature. Note that all quantities in this lecture, in these lectures, are algebraic, namely R is here it's negative. R is the radius of curvature is equal to the, dis the algebraic distance S C. Okay. So and C A prime is given by this relationship. So I'm not going through the details of showing this, but these two points defined by these formulas are rigorously stigmatic for the spherical diopter. And they are very much used in uh, microscope objectives because because precisely there are no aberrations for these points. Uh, then the center of curvature C is its own uh, image, and it is rigorously stigmatic. And also the point, the vertex, is rigorously stigmatic. Uh, yeah, sure. What is the 
bar over the, what's that symbol? The bar here, the bar means, so if you say the axis here is positive from the left to the right, uh, anything with a bar is positive, it is from the left to the right, like C S bar is positive, and reverse wise, uh, S is so bar is negative. So all quantities that we manipulate in objects should be algebraic if you don't want to have headaches with the smile. Note that this example I have deliberately chosen large, large angles. Here, the uh, incoming angle is 60 degrees, but it could be more. And hence, we, we use this kind of configuration in microscope objective where we need to observe small objects with large numerical apertures to get as much light as possible. I give here another example, uh, example of the reflective surface. One can ask oneself the following question, what are the reflective surfaces and what are their, their associated couples of points for which you have regards stigmatism? The answer is that, in general, these surfaces have a conic section. In the case of an object at infinity, it is well known that the uh, stigmatic, the rigorously stigmatic surface is a parabola that focuses light at the, at the focal point. So infinity and focal point are rigorously stigmatic. This is the case of the drawing here. And again, I've chosen a, a numerical aperture here of 60 degrees. In the case, one can show that in the case of um, object and images that are at finite distances, uh, the uh, rigorously stigmatic surfaces are ellipsoidal or hyperboloidal, and they conjugate their focal points. It is well known that if you go in the subject, the, the, the ceiling has an ellip ellip ellipsoidal shape, such that if you're on one side of the, of the train, and you're actually whispering something, the other guy on the other side of the track uh, will hear you as if he was just next to you. Because actually, the, these two points are nearly at the focal points of an ellipse. Right? Uh, the hyperboloidal mirror was also another example. Um, but it's less practical because it has a, in this case you have an object that is real and an image that's virtual. They are all real, so I can't give you an example in, in practice. Um, let me give a few other examples because there are very few, but they're remarkable. And so if you can use them in practice, do so. Refractive surfaces, you don't have only the spherical refractive surface. In the case where A is at infinity, the object is at infinity, the stigmatic condition writes as follows. I mean, you can say it's N, remember? N A I plus N prime I A prime is equal to a constant. Well, here, since A is at infinity, you can put the, the object where, wherever you want along the line horizontal line. And let me take it here, for instance, in H. And thus the stigmatic condition writes N I H minus N prime I A prime is equal to zero. It's a special way of writing a rigorous stigmatism. Well, if A prime is real, this is what you get. It's an ellipsoid. If A prime is virtual, this is you know, the other configuration. Blue means there is a uh, thicker material, okay, glass, for instance, and white means this air. Okay, uh, in the case where A prime is real and the index of refraction is uh, thicker on this side and on the other side, then the stigmatic surface is a hyperboloid or this hyperboloid if you uh, take A prime as being virtual. So these are the four cases. So let me go through now the, the 
attractive surfaces. I already mentioned them. Yeah. How do you define H in the How do I define H? Well, wherever you want is the answer. It should be the I, I have, all I have, for instance, let me, let me take this example. A prime is real. Now the object is at infinity, so it means you've got an axis and the ray is coming from infinity okay. and so the stigmatic relationship writes n a i plus n prime i a prime is equal to a constant now I can choose the constant as I want such that and let me choose a wherever I want according to this constant I take it here, such that this constant is equal to zero. Okay? Then just move around with this equation and you get this. And this, this is the general equation of a surface with a conic section um, with a symmetry of revolution around this axis. And you have the four cases. Okay, so I talked a little bit already about uh, ref reflective surfaces. Um, well, this is a nice drawing that shows that actually you've got an ellipsoid if both A and A prime are real, this is this case, or both are virtual. Here the drawing shows that this small piece of mirror here is rigorously stigmatic for this couple of points. This small piece of mirror here is rigorously stigmatic for these two virtual points. And if one is real and the other one is virtual, then this is the configuration here and there. Okay. These points are the remarkable points of the, of the surfaces with the conic section, the focal points. Right. Well, apart from these remarkable configurations, uh, all other configurations have elevations. So, we have to deal with it. Um, there are two approaches. The geometrical approach is the intuitive one. You just trace rays through the system, and, and you, at each time the ray hits a surface, you apply the snell descartes law. The, 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 the ray gets refracted or reflected, and you keep progressing through the system. That's what uh, optical design software is doing. And in the end, you look in a plane, and you look what are the intercepts of the outgoing rays with the plane. And you get a spot there. What is rigorous stigmatism in that, in, in that respect? Rigorous stigmatism means that your spot diagram is a single dot. All the rays go into a single point. And here is the single point. Okay. So a point object yields a, a point in. Or because you wavelengths are perpendicular to, to the rays, a spherical wave, an incoming <coughs> spherical waveform goes out of the system as a spherical wave. Okay, now you know you have to take into account the fraction, which is okay, the fact that rays are limited transversely by an iris diaphragm. And in the case of the system here, you have to deal with the entrance pupil and the exit pupil. Okay, the iris diaphragm might be somewhere inside, and the exit pupil is the image of the iris diaphragm through all the objects that follow this iris diaphragm. And the same thing reverse wise for the entrance cable. I remind you here a few things. Um, this angle here, I note it's alpha prime m, m like max or, or n like marginal. The marginal ray is a ray that hits the edge of the pupil. 
I remind you the definition of numerical aperture, Na, is n prime sine alpha prime n. You have to take into account, in the definition of the numerical aperture, the index of refraction of the exit material. Um, okay, well, if you take into account the, the diffraction, you know that you never see that. You see an airy pattern. And an airy pattern that has a diameter, a typical diameter, given by this formula. Lambda, subscript vacuum, I, I say this because we, we might forget, but it's really the, the way that in vacuum, okay? And NA takes into account the, the refractive index of the exit material. Um, so the, now, where do aberrations come from? Well, if you restrict yourself to rays that propagate near the optical axis and that make very small angles with respect to the surfaces, then you are in what we call the paraxial approximation. And actually, one can show that in the paraxial approximation, any imaging system is stigmatic for any object point A. Now, the paraxial approximation is a very, very small domain of optics. Incidence in, in the paraxial approximation, incidence angles should be extremely small. I, I, I tested again this approximation when I prepared the lectures. I, I was uh, really uh, surprised how it, it, it doesn't work often, actually. Uh, incidence angles that are, are beyond a few degrees show aberrations. And we'll see many examples of that later. Well, if you work in the fractional approximation, of course you can linearize the snell decoff rule. And working in the fractional approximation means <coughs> that your optical surfaces can be modelized and simplified by uh, polynomials that have an order less than two. I mean parabolas or planes but nothing more than parabolas. As soon as you take into account higher order term, then you have aberrations. Uh, what it means also is that the equations of ray propagation are linear, and you can describe the propagation of rays by the matrix, cal uh, by matrix calculus, ABCD matrices. Now, apart from this, uh, this paraxial approximation, geometrical aberrations are a signature of a deviation from paraxial uh, stigmatism. It means that you have that, that the refraction law becomes, uh, you have to take into account the nonlinearities of the refraction law, the fact that the sign is not uh, a straight line. And it means also you have to take into account surface equations of order uh, st uh, strictly larger than two. So this is what summarizes uh, the problem, basically. If you take an incoming ray at the refractive surface, well, within the paraxial approximation, this would be the outgoing ray. And actually, the real ray goes this way. Um, I'm going to talk also in this course about chromatic aberrations. What, because until now I didn't speak about the fact that you can illuminate your system with several wavelengths at the same time. Chromatic aberrations is the fact that if you send white light, so this is white light, through a, a system, well, because the index of refraction depends on the wavelength, the blue rays and the red rays do not refract in the same directions. So this glass dispersion, this dependency of the refraction index on the wavelength, can be, to first order, uh, summarized in one parameter called the other number, which is nu equal n yellow minus 1 
divided by n blue minus n red. So in the, I mean, this is the definition of the upper number in the visible range. Um, yellow is typically 587 um, nanometer. Uh, that's a sodium line. And then blue is 486 nanometer. And red is 656 nanometer. So this is a definition. Or in other words, you can see it as follows. You can say, well, that's the average index of refraction over the, the visible range, minus 1, which is the difference of the index of refraction to vacuum, divided by delta of n minus 1, or delta n. Okay? So the larger nu, the larger the upper number, or constringency, um, the smaller the dispersion. Okay, now we are coming in the problem of aberrations. And first of all, I wanted to give you a few <coughs> examples because you might think naively that a parallel uh, a window of parallel uh, surfaces is, 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 uh, doesn't introduce any problem. Well, it does. It does. So that's the very first example I give you, just because I, don't, I want you to never forget it. Uh, flat window is a disaster. And we'll go through it later again. A flat window is a disaster. Here, I've, with Oslo, I've taken a flat window with a thickness one millimeter, and uh, incoming rays with an angle of 30 degrees, which means a numerical aperture, sine of m equals 0 0.5. Typically what we have when we use um, lenses to focus beams to trap single atoms. And, well, you should expect an airy pattern with a diameter of 1.4 micron. Well, let us zoom here to see how big the disaster is. Well, rays that propagate with a small angle are by definition paraxial, and they focus at the paraxial image. And this paraxial image You've done this in class probably before. You can calculate the, uh, the displacement of this uh, of the object due to this window as e, the thickness, times one minus one over n, n being the index of refraction of the gas. But actually, if rays propagate with a large angle, they don't focus anymore at the actual image. They focus here. This figure here is characteristic of what is called spherical aberration. We'll see it again later. And the goal of, somehow, I mean, one aspect of these lectures is to be able to calculate this displacement here, because you see that it is related to the transverse aberration. Also, you might think, instead of using refractive systems, to use reflective systems. For some evident reason is that reflective systems do not show any chromatic aberrations. So that they are, they are uh, large range, okay? road range in terms of spectrum. So you might think of using a spherical mirror, because a spherical mirror is almost cheaper than anything else. Again, I took the previous mirror with a 60 degree angle here, and you see the kind of disaster you get. In this case, the numerical aperture is pretty large, and the diameter of the airy pattern is, again, on the order of one micron. Let's zoom in. 
Well, there is nothing fancy about my system here. It's you know a 300 millimeter radius of curvature, and um, here, well, I, I've taken a mirror like this. There's really nothing fancy. Rays, instead of focusing here, focus there. And in this plane here, what you get is a spot diagram with a diameter of 260 meters. I, I do not over exaggerate that, what you see. Well, you have to open your eyes because it's very dim. But, um, okay, well, you see the small dark, dark spot here. This is the emigator that you should have if everything was perfect. So, if you're not happy with this, you'd better buy yourself a parabola. Well, you could argue with me that, yeah, your system is fancy because you took really, really, uh, you're illuminating a large, a large surface. So, of course, you're over-exaggerating to show us. And I counter-argue, no, because let me take now, let, let me illuminate only the central part of, of the mirror, such that the angle of a P is now only 0 0.1 radian. The numerical aperture is only 0 0.1. It means that incidence angles are only 3 degrees. And you see the kind of disaster you have? This is your airy pattern, the one you should have if everything was perfect. And this is what you actually have. Well, if you want to localize an atom here, you're pretty doomed. Okay? It's going to investigate all this area. So is there uh, a better metric in terms of the integrated power as opposed to just where the extremal marginal rays are? Yeah, sure. Sure. Um, we'll see that when we investigate the diffraction approach. Okay? Uh, each dot here corresponds to one ray that hits the pupil. And we have sampled the pupil in, with a grid, uniform. Okay. <clears throat> so the, the, the density of points tells you how much energy you have. Of course, you have more energy here than there, but actually you'll see it's a total disaster. And you'll see it here, because I've thought it was the same way. The point spread function, which is the result of the diffraction approach, you see that instead of having a nice airy pattern, you have this kind of thing. I've normalized graph so that you see really the difference. Okay, so aberrations is really a problem. Let me now go through the uh, through 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 well introducing. There, what characterizes aberrations? I introduced the spot diagram. I talked a little bit about the point spread function. The airy pattern becomes something flatter and broader. But I'll show you that actually it would be better if you use um, what we call the wave aberration. The optical path difference is the quantity that you should consider. Okay, so if you use a geometrical approach, let me define the transverse aberrations as being the quantity, I mean the distance between the paraxial image, B prime P, and the real image, B prime. So you have an object, and in the following I'm going to use these conventions, so let me spend one minute explaining. You have your optical system with an output pupil in front. You have an object in the following. I'm always going to take the object along axis Y. The object is A, B. And you take a real ray in red that is going to hit the exit pupil at the height H and an azimuth angle phi. And Afterwards, the real ray will propagate and it will hit a point in the paraxial plane that is not 
on the fractural image. And we call transverse aberration this distance here, or its projections along the two axes, y prime and x prime. So transverse aberrations are characterized by dy prime and dx prime. So this is like a sort of 3D projection going through? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. This is the optical axis of the, of the system. Is that clear for everybody? OK, and h can vary between minus h max or marginal plus h max. And phi varies between 0 and phi. Of course, the real the intercept point here depends on the three variables, y, h, and phi. So what an optical design software like OSLO does is that it sends, it, it samples the pupil with a grid, and it sends many, many rays, and it plots many, many intercept points and you get a spot diagram. And it plots, then it can plot what they call the ray intercept curves, which are the variation of dy prime versus h for a given azimuth angle equal to zero. So this curve here corresponds to the various impacts, that the height of the impact along the y prime axis when you vary the height of impact in the, in the pupil. dx prime corresponds to the, uh, the distance along the x prime axis. I have actually represented only half of the graph, as, of, as also does, because actually this graph is symmetrical. Why is that? I mean, you can see the spot diagram I have represented is symmetric with respect to this axis. And why is that? It's always the case. It's not an accident. It's always the case because actually I've taken my object along the y direction and the optical system not only has an axis, I assume it's a centered system. All the optics of the system are well centered. And thus the, the, the whole figure has a symmetry around the capital Y axis. So a ray that fits here and symmetrically would end up symmetrically here. Now, all, 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 this assumption breaks down if your system is not centered anymore, if your optics are chaotically aligned. Well, um, when you know more about aberrations, just looking at these curves tells you already what are the aberrations of your system. We'll see that later. Uh, the density of spots in the in the, in, in the fractal plane or in any plane, by the way, intercept plane, uh, yields the encircled energy. If you integrate the points in a circle with increasing radius, you get curves like that. For a stigmatic system, basically, this curve looks increases sharply here, reaches 84%. I can write it, you can write it down. 84% when the radius reaches uh, the airy radius, 1.22. Okay, but 84% is not the unique value. You can, you can be interested in 94% and not 90% of the energy. Okay. Um, now, let me talk about wave aberrations and let me show you why it's more interesting to consider wave aberration than the transverse aberration. And then I'll show you that actually it's more interesting because the, up, the wave aberration is a primitive of the transverse aberration. And I'll show you a few properties. Uh, so, what is the wave aberration? This drawing summarizes the property. <coughs> to 
to make things simple, although you should think of the figure in 3D, I, uh, the point M here, the intercept of the ray with the exit pupil, has a height H and an azimuth angle of phi, but I've projected everything in the, on, the, on the screen. Okay, I didn't make a 3D. <laughs> Okay, so what's the optical path difference? What's delta, the wave aberration? Well, it is this distance in black here, which is a zoom of this area. Uh, so again, we consider a real ray that intersects the parachial plane in B prime. And we consider parachial rays that would focus there. And I consider a reference sphere, S, that intersects the exit pupil at point P prime. And I now consider in red the real wavefront, distorted signal. Well, the real ray intersects the exit pupil in M, the sphere in I prime, the real wavefront J prime, and the optical path difference is defined as this distance between the reference sphere and the real ray front along the real ray. Okay, this is the definition. This quantity can be measured in practice in the lab using interferometers, and you can get 3D maps of your. OPD, of your optical path difference, in units of lambda. Well, the, the way you do that is you have the wavefront, the real wavefront, interfere with a reference plane that has not gone through the, the, the system with aberrations. For instance, the two wave interferometer, Michelson, Morphizo, and you get and you get fringes like that. And this interfer from this interferogram, you extract a map of the wave front. This. So, why? I mean, how, how do you? I'm going to show how you calculate this wave front using an optical design software. How do you go from ray tracing to wavefront? And how do you... Um, and then why is it convenient to talk about wave aberration rather than transverse aberration? How do you go from one to another? From the other? Because in the, in, the, in, the, in the lectures, I'm going to talk in... Because the Zygo classification of the aberration is based on the wave aberration. Okay, so how do you calculate the wave aberration? The wave aberration delta, I'm going to show that it's equal to n prime delta is equal to the difference of these two quantities, LP prime and LM. LM is the optical path, optical path length, between the object and, well, this intercept point here, going through any point in the exit tube. So again, you remember, it's not a geometrical distance because you have to take into account the index of refraction. Okay, so that's why I put some parentheses here to say it's an optical path. And LP prime is the same thing if you take a real ray that hits the exit pupil through its center P prime. Okay, so I'm going to show that this n prime delta is equal to L P prime, the optical path length, following this special ray, minus the optical path length going through this ray. 